Hi, I'm Jordan. Thanks for checking out this walkthrough of 2D game lighting. This video is part coding tutorial for GameMaker and part explanation of the mathematical and theoretical concepts behind the code. So even if you don't use GameMaker yourself, this video should prove useful if you want to learn about 2D lighting. And GameMaker language, having a similar syntax to JavaScript, should be easily interpretable if you want to code this system in any other language. How does light work? I'm no physicist, but my faded memories of science class and a quick Wikipedia search tell me that light travels as a ray from its source, and when it collides with an object, it is reflected into our eyeballs where it's perceived by our brains. Luckily, when it comes to 2D lighting simulations, we don't have to recreate all the complexities of real life, but the fundamentals are the same. In this tutorial, we're going to cover an additive lighting system. Additive describes the fact that we're drawing the light over the shadow instead of the other way around. I've chosen to demonstrate a system which is really intuitive but might not be the most performant option. If you need high performance, use this video as a jumping off point to kickstart your understanding and do some more research. Just as in real life, the system works by emitting rays of light from a source, in this case the player, and then colliding with an object. We'll then use all the information about how far the light rays traveled to construct a polygon representing the visible area, aka everywhere the light can reach. Let's go through the full concept on paper first to make sure our understanding is 100%. Let's say that this box represents the room we're in, and it's made up of four straight lines for walls. In the middle of the room, let's place our player. If our player is emitting light in all directions, what do we expect would happen? The room should fill with light. So let's emit four rays of light from the player to the corners of the room, thus splitting it into four triangles. We can then fill these triangles in with light. Now let's move to a second room with the same setup, apart from there's a box in the corner of the room. Let's start emitting rays from the player to the corners of the room. Also emit rays to the corners of the box. Here we can see a problem. Two of these rays are going through the objects, which is not how most light beams work in real life. Let's pretend they collided with the box and just cut them off on the edge. Now we've split the room up into triangles again, and if we fill them all up, we're left with an area representing our darkness. Now that you hopefully understand the theory of our lighting system, let's get to work implementing it. Load up GameMaker and make sure you have a player sprite, a wall sprite, a floor sprite, and a light sprite. I'm using Kenny's rolling ball assets for this tutorial, so you can click the link in the description to download those for free, but otherwise use whatever assets you like. I'll explain the light sprite later, but you can download the one I made from the description. Start by making an object called obj underscore control. This is where all of our code will go. In the control object, we'll need a create event to initialize our lists, structs, and functions, a step event to handle casting the rays, and a draw event to draw everything to the screen. First, in the create event, start by using window set cursor to get rid of the default windows cursor because we'll draw our own cursor later. Next, we're gonna use dslist create to create three lists storing points, walls, and rays. Points will store the corners of every object we need to emit rays towards. Walls will store the lines that comprise each wall object, and rays will store every ray emitted by the player. Then we're going to write a constructor function, vec2, short for vector2, which is how we're going to define our points. A vector2 is just a struct with an x and y position. Let's make another constructor function for our line structs. Each line is made up of two points, a and b, to define its start and end position. Within this constructor function, we'll have another function, hit. Hit will check for an intersection between the line and a wall. In the hit function, start by initializing local variables for the closest wall, u, and t values, setting them all to minus one. If we loop through every wall to check for collisions, we may be going through two walls or more and stop at the further wall just because it was the one we checked last. To stop this, we need to store the values of the closest wall we've hit so far to not register collisions with further walls. Now we'll loop through all the lines in the walls list and store the current line as the variable wall. Here we encounter our first bit of complicated maths for calculating line intersections, but I'll walk you through it. Simply put, we can define every position along our lines as the start position plus some amount of the way towards the end position. Values T and U I already introduced to you will represent the position along each line. On screen now, you can see the Wikipedia article for line intersection, and it demonstrates how you can rearrange these line formulas to find out where there is a collision between the two lines. First, work out the distances between the start and end points of the wall, the ray, and the wall and the ray. Note how the denominator, what's on the bottom, 
is the same for finding both t and u, so store that as a variable we'll call den. You should see how the start and end points of both the ray and the wall correspond to the values x and y in the example. Next, do the same but for the values of t and u, making sure all of your operators are correct, because small mistakes are easy to miss and hard to find but mess everything up. After each calculation, make sure to divide everything by the denominator. Now we know that as long as t is between 0 and 1, we're along the wall line, and as long as u is greater than 0, we're heading in the right direction. So, just checking that the collision is the closest, we can say that we know there is a collision. In that case, set these values as the closest, and then the for loop will carry on. After the for loop is done, we can return a new vector 2 with the point where the collision is. The formula used is taken from this part of the Wikipedia page. The final function we'll make in the create event is just called rectangle and is used to initialize the walls around the room and the walls which will make up the object. As arguments, this function takes the rectangle's position, size and angle. To define the lines, we start by defining the four corners of the rectangle, A, B, C and D. Each corner is a new vector 2 struct and taking the top left corner as an example, to get to the left position of the rectangle, we'll take the center x position and minus length der x. Then to get to the top left position, we just minus length der x but substitute width for height, and instead of our angle being horizontal, minus 90 to turn it upwards. Do the same for the center y position, but use length der y. Now duplicate this vector to and just change the operators to correspond to the other corners. Then you can add these structs to the points list and make some new lines to add to the walls list. Having finished with the create event, let's move to the step event. First things first, we need to move the object to the mouse position. Then we'll clear all of our lists so that the lighting is recalculated every step. Then we'll set up our walls. Make a wall object if you haven't done so already. First, create a rectangle the size of the room in the center of the room, and then loop through all of the wall objects and make a rectangle at their position with their size and angle. You'll notice I minus four pixels from the size of my walls. That's because the art assets I'm using have rounded corners and I'd rather the light went through the walls a little bit than stuck out a little bit. You can just do whatever you want. We're going to make a grid which we'll use to sort our values later. It just needs to be able to contain each ray's endpoint and direction. We'll also make a count variable which will count how many rays there are. You'll notice I multiply the list size by three and that's because we're gonna create three rays for every ray which we'll check around the corners. Now that we've initialized all the rectangles and know all the points we need to emit rays towards, make a for loop to loop through all of the points. Make a vector 2 for the current position and get the current point as well, then work out the direction from the current position to the current point. Set up the variable O which will be our offset value. I found 0.1 to work well. We use this to cast a ray directly towards the corner and also one a little to the left and a little to the right so that our light will spill around corners naturally. Use this value to write a for loop which will give a value of minus 0 0.1, 0 and 0 0.1. Then change the current point to a new point in the direction we worked out but offset. The distance can be anything positive, it doesn't really matter. Then add a new line between the current position and current point to the rays list. This line we've made is a ray emitting from the player's position in the direction of a corner. With this line we can use the hit function we made to change p to the position of the collision. Then add p to the first column of the grid at the count row and add the direction in the second column. Then make sure to increment count. Finally, in the step event, sort the grid by the column containing the directions. This sorts all the points by the direction between them and the player's position, so that when we make triangles out of the points, they're all in order and we can just loop through them. Speaking of, click over to the draw event and make a for loop to go through the grid we just made. Just before that though, make sure to start drawing our primitive. This is just the shape which will make up all of our light. Get the current point, and then also get the next point, which can be called Q. We're going to use a ternary operator here to say that if we are before the final grid value, the next point is at i plus 1. But if we're in the final grid value, the next point is actually the first point in position 0. Here we can say that we want to draw a vertex at our position, the collision point and the next collision point. Now, outside of the loop, stop drawing the primitive. Next, we're going to draw the light sprite, which is a large grey rectangle with a smooth cutout in the middle, which is going to act as the fade out for our light. The rectangle needs to be twice the width of the room, so that if you're in the corner of the room, the rectangle covers still the whole of the room. The shade of grey it is will also affect how dark the shadow seems. Finally, we'll set the blend mode, which is how colours interact on top of each other, to multiply the destination colour by the source colour. We'll then draw our floor sprite tiled so it fills out the whole room. 
because we're multiplying the floor color by everything we've already drawn, it's being multiplied by the gray, which will make things darker. It will also be multiplied by the background, which is the same color gray. So the only white will be the triangles we've drawn to represent our light. Make sure to reset the blend mode to normal when we've finished. On top of this, we can then draw ourselves. Before we run the game, create a room and on one layer place the control object and on top of that place the walls however you want. Also make sure that the colour of the background is the same as the colour of the light sprite. Now you can hit run. Hopefully what you can see is all of your walls and then some rays of light shining through the gaps between them. Notice how the lights work perfectly with rotated objects and how smooth everything is even around corners. That's it for this tutorial, I hope it's been helpful. If you've been following along with this tutorial and implementing this for yourselves, I hope you're happy with the result and understand how everything works. If not, please drop a comment and I'll endeavour to fix a bug or explain myself better. If you make anything cool, please make sure to share it in the comments. If you want to see more kinds of these videos, please give the video a like, maybe subscribe and maybe hit the notification bell. And also leave a comment about the video about my code or with any ideas for future topics. That's all from me, see you in the next video.